How's it going, Lisa? Bruce is up. I'll be six and welcome back to Choices That Matter and the Sun Went Out. It is time for us to continue our little story here. It is story time, so sit back, relax, chill out, or maybe listen. The good thing is you don't have to watch these videos. You can just listen along and you can get a pretty good idea. Of, I mean, you're not seeing anything anyway, except Modi's stupid face. Isn't that right, Modi? Anyway, so you can just put it on the background, listen to a nice story. It's going to be a good time. Uh, right now we are confronted with the COG people and deciding whether we're going to hang with them or not. And even though they sound completely nuts, pretty much everyone around here does. So, and you know, Professor Sub is definitely connected to them, so let's let's hang with them. Alright, but Etienne stays with me. Vivian led us to a medical lab and asked, us to, asked a nurse to draw some of my blood. It was weird, but simple enough. The scientists were buzzing around the lab. One of them smeared a drop of my blood on a glass slide and inserted it under a huge microscope. Enlarged images of my blood cells were suddenly splashed all over one of the walls of the lab. Vivian and a few other scientists gathered around them and started discussing among themselves. She shook her head and then started again, this time with some sort of dye added to my blood smear on the slide. After about an hour of waiting for someone to tell us the results of the test, Vivian suddenly stopped in surprise as she walked past me, as if only just realising I was still there. This can take all day, you don't have to wait here, she told me. Sighing, Etienne and I left the lab. Etienne and I went back to the ground level and relaxed as well as we could, staring at the windows at the grassy courtyard at the centre of number five. As we started talk as we talked through the implications of our day, Dolores called me. So tell me, she said smoothly, have you found anything that's of any use to General Resources Inc? Uh, I'll tell her everything. I mean, we work for her, right? Pretty much. I told her everything. Geology was a dead end and the entire center was a hive of paranoia, and a fringe group had decided I was the key to something. It was my job to tell her everything, after all. And what do I tell GRI? She asked. Setting my conscience aside for the greater good, I took the formal tone of an official report and gave her advice that was the most useful, ob most obviously useful. Tell GRI to buy up as many other energy companies as possible. They're dropping like flies at the moment and GRI needs to ride the wave of panic. When the sun returns for good, their investments will be worth billions. Excellent, said Dolores. So the sun is definitely not going to go out for good. You're certain of that. Tell GRI that I am. If I'm wrong, I'll have greater issues than their anger to deal with. I heard her muttering a dictation to her own motocon device. Investments will be worth billions. Dolores went on. Spread news of scientific discord and the use... And the rise of doomsday cults. Wait, what? You're not going to deliberately spread panic. I'm going to massively increase profits, yes, she said stiffly. That's our job, remember? Besides, it's all true. I looked at Modi and bit my lip. You should leave Japan, by the way, she said. Your old friend Victor Santiago, the, take the golden eye, who probably killed your professor, has just boarded a flight to Tokyo. It seems he's figured out where you are. We're only just getting somewhere, I said. I'm not leaving now. Sure, sure, you do what you like. Just keep sending updates for GRI. We'll talk again later. She hung up. Victor Santiago is in Japan, I told Etienne, and filled him in on the rest. He nodded and glanced away for a minute. Do you think Victor knows we know about him? Good question. Come on, we need to warn people about Victor before he kills more scientists. Like the professor. Etienne smiled a little at that. My thoughts exactly. Lead the way. I stopped walking and studied the park warden's face. He tried to hide it, but I could see the pain behind his smile. Oh, of course. How can they be so insensitive? I keep forgetting that Professor Sol was Etienne's father. Sorry, I wasn't thinking. You okay? Etienne shut his eyes and sighed. I don't know. He was silent for a minute. The man who killed my dad is coming to us, and I don't know how I should feel about that. Not knowing what to say, I simply put a comforting hand on his shoulder. The park warden shrugged his mood off and gave me a small smile. I'll be fine, really. Come on, Matron will want to know what to do about Victor. Etienne nodded and fell in beside me. He told Matron everything we knew about Victor Santiago, and she rewarded us by increasing the access p possibilities on our IDs. So what are we doing about Victor, I asked. Let me worry about that, she replied firmly. And that was it. I had the impression she had the situation under control. We met several acquaintances on our way back to the dining hall, and chatted with them amicably enough. None of our conversations uncovered anything new, however. The moment I entered the dining hall, I heard Vivian yelling my name. 
The cog group had deliberately chosen an over-large table near the main entrance. Joining them, I asked about the results of the tests. Nothing conclusive yet, unfortunately, the scientist replied. We'll keep analysing the data, of course. Disappointed, I leaned back. I was so curious about it, too. Any chance you'd be up for more tests? More data wouldn't hurt. More tests? Suddenly I had flashback to Professor Sol subjecting me to random but harmless experiments, often without even asking me. It had started with innocent requests like these, too. Okay, fine. For the greater good, the scientists respond with an ominous fervour, but eventually settled down and laid out a proposal for a series of simple tests they wanted to repeat or hadn't done the first time. Nothing sounded too onerous, so I agreed to them all. Later that night, I found myself stretched out on my bed, enjoying the silence. Even though I was exhausted, I couldn't sleep. On a whim, I called Sharon. She opened the conversation with a noisy yawn. Everything alright? I glanced around me at a giant windowless box. More or less. You sound worried about something. I told Sharon about Victor Santiago, and she laughed at the end of it. If I knew it would be so exciting down there, I'd have followed you. No, I'm glad you didn't come. It's dangerous. She snorted, like that would stop me. I laughed. I know, you're kind of invincible. I told her I was worried about Etienne and how he would react if we crossed paths with the man who killed his father. Sharon told me to trust that he could handle it, being a park warden and all. Then we started chatting about the 100th day cult. It was about that moment I, it suddenly occurred to me. Sharon and Etienne weren't just persons of interest in my job anymore. They were my friends. Arc 5 completed. Whoa, that was quite quick, that one. You and 51% of players have gained the special interest of the COG people. Ah, okay. So that's really, that's our most common one yet. 51%. I guess everyone, you know, I mean, the COG people are really interesting, aren't they? I mean, what the hell is their deal? Etienne and I discussed our next move over breakfast, so I guess we're going to find out what their deal is soon enough. I wanted to find out more about the astronomy department, but Etienne was concerned about Victor Santiago's presence in Tokyo. I'd like to see Miss Enomoto again, he said. Miss who? Oh, I mean Matron. Oh, okay. First name basis now, are we? Okay, firstly, Etienne said, quickly said, blushing a little. Enomoto is her last name, not first. I chuckled a little. And secondly, grow up, he said. I'm not the one with the high school crush, I replied with a smile. Etienne laughed. Say, if Matron has a thing for me, she would have offered her first name too, right? Yeah, uh, sure. She's beautiful, isn't she, he continued. Like, really beautiful, and strong, and smart, and kind. Amazing all round, really. Wait, you really are crushing on Matron. The park warden shrugged. Maybe I am. Really? He looked at me and smiled. Why, are you jealous? <laughs> I'm just worried to eat you alive. Etienne smiled as he finished his breakfast. I have to admit, I said to him, I figured you'd have a secret lover or something, considering the amount of texting you do before sleep. Etienne seemed surprised. Oh, you saw that? He cleared his throat a little. That's just Pierre. He's my best friend. Kinda. Kinda? It's complicated. Sensing he didn't want to continue this discussion, I simply nodded and finished my breakfast. In any case, I'm going to attempt to convince Miss, en Miss Enomoto to let me help her with security, Etienne said. What are you planning to do? I'll poke around in astronomy. I went upstairs to the astronomy department, which had three entire floors devoted to its laboratories and sleeping quarters, not including the roof. As promised by Matron, we now have access to more areas, teacher. Smiling, I agreed with Modi. It felt good to have the right access codes. I gave myself a thorough tour of the entire area, noting a few architectural quirks among the general layout. It was immediately obvious when I crossed paths with the department head. She was surrounded by hanger-ons and self-consciously cliched white coats, all of them flapping as they walked. The overall impression was a flock of earnest white birds. The leader of the V formation stopped when she saw me. Who are you and what are you doing here? I have information to trade. I watched as he mentally slotted me into the file. Non-scientist but useful. Follow me, she said, and I did. One of the hanger-ons addressed her as Dr. Simmet, which was as close to an introduction as I was likely to get. Oh, this laboratory is very white. I shall adjust my contrast settings. I wish I could do the same. Every surface of the main astronomy lab was white. Benches, walls, floor. The sinks were fashioned from white ceramic, the computers were white, and a surprising amount of equipment around the room was white, 
rather than the grey, rather than grey or metallic. Three enormous whiteboards were set up in a row along one side of the room, each with several magnetic strips at the top. One of the scientists in a flapping lab coat unrolled a series of transparencies, each one taller and wider than the dining table. He hung two on top of each other on, a whiteboard, on each whiteboard. The math is, of course, more complex, said Dr. Simmet, but you can see why we've chosen such a radical direction to investigate. I looked closer, observing that each pair of transparencies was a view of the night sky taken from the same location. The stars overlap perfectly, although the sizes of each star didn't seem perf to perfectly match their counterparts. Some stars on each transparency were missing. I examined the whiteboards in silence, then turned to see everyone staring at me. They looked tense. And this radical direction is? I asked. Dr. Simmet lifted her chin defiantly. Time travel. Brilliant. At first, we expected to discover at least some kind of planet-wide disturbance, said Dr. Schmidt, Simmet, but the basement boffins insisted there's no evidence of any geological change whatsoever. That's true, I said, and they have no reason to lie, since the admission makes them irrelevant. Hmm, said Dr. Simmet. It appears that a large section of the universe is shifting in time, but we are not. My mind attempted to comprehend the implications, but they are well beyond me. Teacher, there is no evidence that time travelling is possible. And time is relative, so, so it's happening all the time, really. Until now, she said in response to Modi, we have the data. Now we just need the math to back up the theory, and everyone here is working on that. You sure it's time travel? There's no other explanation? She waved at the transparencies with the stars again. What can possibly explain this? Observing my awestruck expression, she continued, This is the greatest innovation of our time, of any time. History will remember this moment as the moment the past and present had their first kiss. So you're right, how do we make it stop? Stop, she said. This is the greatest breakthrough of our time. Why be so small-minded? I kept my temper and excused myself, finding a tiny room which had a sink, two chairs and a TV playing local news broadcasts with English subtitles. I wasn't sure what I was expecting, but I wondered if the scientists in number five were losing their sanity. Or worse, what if they were right? I enjoyed the relative quiet as much as I enjoyed the glimpse of life outside the intrigues of number five. Then I saw a face I recognised on the television screen. Akio, the young pop star from the plane ride to Japan. He was on stage, singing his heart out with an original song, and the crowd of teenagers in front of him was screaming in ecstasy. Even through the tiny TV, the song was powerful. It was followed by an interview in Akio's palatial home. I was beginning to think that his decision to skip school for the Hong Kong singing contest was an excellent career move, not that he needed the prize money. Is it traditional to congratulate an acquaintance on their success? Yes, Modi, it is. Understood, teacher. Modi didn't say anything after that, but I heard the telltale sounds of a dial tone. I felt uneasy. Um, Modi, what are you doing? I'm calling Mr. Akio to congratulate him, teacher. He was very nice to us on the plane, he's an accomplished singer. Don't you agree, teacher? No, I mean, yes, he's very accomplished. I trailed off, speechless. It took a moment to search for the right words. Modi, we shouldn't just call someone we just met. He's practically a stranger. But Mr. Akio gave us his phone number. Therefore, he's not a stranger. Am I mistaken, teacher? Click. Hello. Akio's voice came through my phone. I was planning to stop the call, but it was too late. I sighed slightly before introducing myself. Akio suddenly sounded excited. Oh, you're from the plane. Your Modi was very funny. You remember us, I asked? Of course, he exclaimed laughing. It's not every day a Modicon device tries to sing along with me. Chuckling, I congratulated him on his concert, and he asked me how my investigation was going. It's a mixed bag, I answered, saying. I briefly wondered how much I should tell a 15-year-old teenager. I've learned a lot, but it still doesn't fit together, and my friend's murderer is in Japan. What? Akio exclaimed. He immediately grilled me for the details. Yeah, a lot has happened since we parted ways. The teenager was mature, well beyond his years, so I told him about Victor Santiago and that I was worried for the scientist's safety in number five. Bring them here, Akio offered suddenly. I blinked. What? Always send them here without your knowledge. That's probably safer. I'll send my head of security and meet your scientists at a public place and transport them to my house. Wait, back up. You want to hide scientists in your house from a dangerous murderer? He just laughed. I could take 50 or so people and feed them for about a month. Would that work? Even if your murderer managed to figure out I have a scientist, my security system is exceptional, and who would look for them here? 
a uh, tried to think of a rebuttal. Do you really think your parents would let it, you just take in 50 bickering house guests for an indeterminate period of time? They're right here next to me, he said. They've always wanted to become a research scientist and cure cancer. Well, this is the closest thing they're going to get. I laughed. Akio, you're one crazy pop star. So it's agreed then. I'll get back to you on that, I replied. Thanks. You're a lifesaver. Literally. After hanging up, I reunited with Etienne and told him about Akio's offer. The pop star's home usually has impeccable security, he noted. I think we should take it. I nodded. Okay, it's decided then. But how do we choose the 50 scientists? Um, yeah, I guess Matron should decide, really. I waited several hours until Matron was available to hear about Akio's offer. Technically, this offer is an insult to our rigorous security measures, she said. However, it is too good an opportunity to waste. Honestly, I don't know if it's safer here or there, I admitted. I appreciate that, she said. I think Akio's residence would be very useful as an independent cell, covering a range of specialties in case we things go awry here. I gave her Akio's number. I'll keep any arrangements confidential from you and your associates, she said. Your connection to Vin Victor Santiago might be more than mere coincidence. Will you be leaving number five, she asked. I don't know. I, we've got nowhere to go. Not yet. Alright, she said. What else can we do to make it safe here, teacher? I thought about Modi's question. We'd investigated the facility from within for the past few hours. Perhaps it's time to examine it from the outside. We could look at the fake lobby and speak to the fake receptionist who was also known as the Dragon. And speak the outside. Matron granted the request for us to leave the facility, advising me not to waste my freedom watching TV. I told, took her warning as it was meant. Etienne seemed to be excited about leaving. The park warden would probably enjoy a breath of non-recycled air after all this time. We circled the building slowly, studying the building from the outside, determined to find a weakness in security. I walked up to the wall and touched it. It's too smooth to climb up the windows, I remarked. With the right equipment, nothing's unclimbable, Etienne replied. True, but we'll be able to spot any climbers from the camera feeds, I'm guessing. I pointed to the small cameras high up on the wall. Let's just hope there isn't a blind spot then, Etienne said as he walked ahead of me and pushed the wall with his palms, as if trying to find a secret entrance. I glanced at the cameras. It didn't look like there would be a blind spot, but the only way we could be sure is to see the feeds themselves. We'd better check the feed later, I said. Come on, let's check the other wall. The park warden nodded in agreement. Same thing on this wall, Etienne said. You have to give them points for consistency. I smiled and turned away from the walls. The building's pretty exposed to shops and cafes too. I glanced around the area. It seems pretty secure. Suddenly I spotted something in the cafe area. Cafe across the road, I saw Dr. Carmen Wales staring blindly out the window and crying uncontrollably. Looking and nodding at each other, Etienne and I went over to her. As soon as we walked in the door, she stopped crying. He's here, she said. Who, I asked. Pleased to see Etienne carefully scan the room and then position himself where he could keep an eye on all the exits. The man who tried to kill me, she said. He's here. He's going to kill us all. Her face crumpled. He saw me, he said. Hello, and then he just walked away. As if there were absolutely nothing I could do to stop him finding me a third time and killing me. Where did he go? I don't know, she said. How did he find me? Through your phone. She jumped and stared at Modi. What do you mean? Someone has placed an electronic surveillance device on your mobile. Given that Victor Santiago has now accosted you on two con continents, it is likely the 100th day group has been tracking you. She pushed back her chair as if her phone was about to burst into flames. How do I make it stop? Following Modi's direction, I sorted through all her belongings. The bug on the phone was the only one, and it was easily destroyed. Don't go back to number five, Etienne advised her. Leave here, and go somewhere else in Tokyo. Somewhere far away, but still public. Call my friend Akio, I added, and tell me you need a place to stay. He'll make arrangements to pick you up, and host you until Victor Santiago is out of Tokyo. She blew her nose and shook my hand, standing and dropping bills on the table for her unfinished coffee. All right, I'll do that. Etienne and I walked with her to the closest taxi rank and watched as she walked as she was out of sight. We returned to number five and entered the fake lobby to let the dragon know Victor Santiago was spotted in the area. She wasn't seated at her desk. My heart thumped in my chest at the sight. Her dead body was sprawled behind it, already cooling. Her nail file was still clutched in her hand, the blade covered in blood from her struggle against their attacker. 
She had three bullet wounds in her chest and abdomen, all of which, le which leaked blood into a sticky pool around her. And matched her fingernail polish exactly. Um, called Matron directly. I called Matron and told her everything. She didn't speak for a long time. At last she said, that's it then, we're done. Santiago usually kills people when they're alone, I told her. I think we should gather everyone in the dining hall for safety. Understood. Will you join them? You're not coming? There's a chance I can track him from here. Etienne and I locked the foyer and went through the back kitchen into number five. Why did you kill the dragon? Etienne asked. She wasn't a researcher. Self-defense, I said at once. She recognized him and attacked with the nail file, so he shot her. Look, Etienne said, pointing at the stained tile in the kitchen. Blood. That has to be Victor's. I nodded in agreement. She didn't die for nothing, I said. Mighty, please tell Matron that Santiago was wounded and bleeding. Yes, teacher. Shall we split up or stay together? Etienne asked. He knows we're not researchers, so we're relatively safe. Uh, we should stay together anyway. The dining hall was packed with terrified nerds, but even with so many people, it was clear that some of them were searching the crowd for missing colleagues. There are so many people here, teacher. I'm unable to spot Victor Santiago in this room. I don't think everyone's in the dining hall yet. Shall we stay to protect them, teacher? Or leave to search for the stragglers? We've got to find the stragglers. Hey, I called at the lone scientist in the corridor. It hadn't taken long for me to find a straggler. You need to head to the dining hall, I told him. He shook his head, distressed. I can't. I have to find my partner. She might be in the dining hall waiting for you, I said. What's her name? Him. Jeremy Tong. He's an etherite. I'll find him if he's out there, and I'll send him to the dining hall. You should go there right now. Okay, he thanked me and left. Teacher, I don't think the astronomers are in the dining hall either. I'm unable to see any of them. Let's find Jeremy first. I headed directly for the Etherite's living quarters, looking for the red-headed Jeremy Tom. I found him. He'd been shot in the face at point-blank range. I saw the blood splatter on the wall before I saw his body. He was sprawled face down on the floor with one hand raised to his head as if a failed attempt to shield himself from Santiago's bullet. Etienne swore quietly. I called Matron and told her Santiago had committed a second murder. I know, she said irritated. I saw the body a few minutes before you did, but I haven't found our killer yet. It's a big building. I'm going to help her, said Etienne. How about you? <laughs> Shouting for Victor de Shumza is not going to help. Assist a mat Matron with surveillance. I went to Matron's office and found a wasteland of smashed computers. Etienne and Matron were both standing in the middle of the room. Etienne gave me a shaky smile while nodding at the state of the room. Santiago paid a visit. I walked among the shattered glass, plastic and motherboards. Is anything left? Only the tracking system, said Matron. So I can't see anyone directly, but I can see where all my people are. Or more accurately, where their access cards are. I looked over her shoulder and saw that the blinking dots were gathered in the dining hall, except for two in Matron's office and one for Jeremy Ton. From the dots in the office, it was clear that Matron hadn't put a tracker on her own card. It was strange that the dragon didn't seem to have a tracker on her card either. What happens if someone breaks their ID card? Etienne asked. An alarm goes off in here, and their light turns red, she said. Good, said Etienne. We can ask people to break their card if they see Santiago. She actually cracked a smile at that briefly. Uh, we should stay with them, to keep an eye out. I heard police sirens. They drew closer and closer until it was clear that they were parked immediately outside the building. No one's on guard, Matron said, checking his screen. You better go and meet them. Yes, ma'am, I said, and went to the lift at once. They went at the back of the building, but I quickly found them attempting to find a way into the foyer. I locked the door when I found the dead body. I told them Modi translated my words into Jap- As Modi translated my words into Japanese. She's behind the desk, and the man who killed her is inside the building, and will definitely kill more people if he's not stopped. The officer I spoke to immediately assigned two officers to make sure I didn't leave. Four to break in and examine the dragon, and the rest to go inside. There's no way inside through the foyer, I said. The main entrance is through the kitchen at the back. The officer in charge raised an, raised an eyebrow, but 30 seconds into, in the foyer was sufficient to support my statement. I found myself leading the way into number five as one of the policemen called for backup. Take them to Matron. Matron was livid when the police insisted she leave her office to join the rest of the building in the dining hall, but I could see Etienne was relieved. Santiago had already broken into her office once. We went to the dining hall. 
where the sight of several armed police officers instantly calmed the frightened residents. They sorted everyone into groups and checked every person against my photo of Victor Santiago before starting interrogations. The police let me sit with the etherites. Did you find Jeremy? Wong asked desperately. I winced. They all understood instantly and Wong was the only person who immediately began to cry. I wish with increasing desperation that I'd sat somewhere, anywhere else. It seemed I was constantly running late. Including Professor Sol, this was the third time the etherites had been attacked by the Hundredth Day Cult. I still didn't know why. Comfort him as well as possible? Why would... It'll be alright, I said gently. Wong turned his tear-stained face towards me. Will it really? What logic led to that conclusion? Uh... It was a relief when the police finally drew me aside and asked a series of increasingly aggressive questions about what I was doing in Tokyo. I spotted Etienne watching from across the room and discreetly shook my head, hoping he'd stay away from me. Answer honestly. We haven't done anything wrong. It was no use. I was one of the half dozen people chosen to enjoy further questioning at the station. We were advised to bring anything we needed for an overnight stay. My only comfort was that there was plenty more police staying with the residents of Number 5, and I was sure that a large portion of Number 5's residents had already quietly slipped away. I was put in a cell by myself, which at least meant I didn't need to deal with anyone else's fears. My own were quiet enough. Teacher, can I do something to help? Ask Modi to break into the police records? Might as well. I can't access the files, teacher. They're protected by a password. Don't worry, Modi. I'm sure it'll be fine. There was nothing to do, and even with my body aching from the horrors and fears of the day, the narrow bed was looking inviting. I advised Dolores of the situation. Dolores picked up right away. Let me guess, she said. Santiago's causing trouble. I remembered the slumped figure of the dragon behind her desk and bit back the urge to snap at Dolores. Yes, I said simply. In related news, I'm being held for questioning. I heard the hiss as she sucked in her breath. Did you say anything about GRI? Not a word. The company, she said. I knew that I was a consultant for an American company. I paused delicately. So far. Fine, she said. Give me an hour. Forty minutes later, the steel door of my cell crashed open. A female officer stood looking at me. Okay, she said, with barely an accent. Come with me. She escorted me to a desk where I signed for my belongings. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us? She said with an unconvincingly casual air. Have you caught Santiago? Santiago escaped, she admitted, but the neighborhood is safe now. I spent two frustrating hours watching the meter on a taxi rise to ludicrous heights as we crawled through traffic back to Maneki Neko Street. I spotted two obvious plain clothes Clay's plain clothes police in the cafe, complete with prop coffees. Well, at least the police were sticking around. The foyer at number five was thoroughly blocked off and wrapped in so much crime tape it looked like an oversized Christmas gift. I went around the back and found the kitchen entrance guarded by a pair of young officers. Are you the only police left here, I asked. They exchanged a glance, evidently aware of their colleagues in the cafe. Yes, said the shorter of the pair. Uh-huh, I said, resisting the urge to roll my eyes. Go straight into the dining hall. They clearly didn't know whether to take me seriously or not and ultimately let me inside. I headed straight to the dining hall, ignoring the sensation that I was being watched. Modi, I said. If you were Santiago, where would you be right now? If I was Mr. Santiago, I'd leave Tokyo for my own safety. However, Mr. Santiago is not as rational as I am. There are several br brilliant scientists left in this building. I do not think Mr. Santiago can resist such an opportunity. I agree, I said. Santiago hasn't escaped. He's hiding somewhere close by, probably in this building. Please be careful, teacher. I couldn't help walking faster. The short distance to the dining hall felt like forever. I was short of breath when I finally walked through the door and joined the 50-odd people remaining at number five. Number five. People had strung up sheets, tablecloths, and blankets in order to give themselves the illusion of privacy. No one dared leave the dining hall. Modi and I weren't the only ones who thought Santiago wasn't done with us yet. Etienne spotted me and came over to, at once to ask if I was all right. Sure, I said. I like to get myself incarcerated every time I visit a new continent. Congratulations, then, he said, but his face was grave. What's wrong, I asked. I mean, other than the immediately obvious. I don't want to leave this room undefended, he said, but it's been hours since I saw Matron. Or any of the etherites. Don't worry, I said. I saw Santiago earlier. He didn't even try to hurt me. You stay here and I'll go. He paused and evidently torn. All right, but promise you you won't do anything stupid if you see him. Maybe you'll keep an eye out, I said. We'll see him first and run away like a startled cat. 
He nodded in approval. Try Matron's office first, I suppose. The door to Matron's office is wide open. I've never seen it like that. Teacher? Yes, Modi, I see the door. I stalked closer, slowly, keeping my breath steady and quite quiet despite the thumping in my heartbeat. Do you hear that? I stood still. Hear what? Someone is crying. A few steps later, I heard it too. The wrenching sobs of a person who had lost all hope. They keened like a wounded dog and I knew the voice was female. The sound was coming from Matron's office. Alright, we're going to wrap this one up here because we're out of time for today. But uh, I guess we should get Etienne to comfort her in the next one. Looking forward to more story time. This is going to be a, a long story by the look of it. We've been well, we've been at this for like, what, three hours maybe? This, this is pretty sizable. There's a lot of words. <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for hanging out with me and I'll see you in the next one.